Hey there, Impact Wrestling fans. First of all, I want to say, if you're listening to this, I really hope you're a subscriber at the Impact Lounge. I am BQ, and I do do this for the Impact Wrestling fans, so please hit that subscribe button if it's your first time. Let me jump right into this. Just finished listening to the interview done in the UK with Don Callis, Scott D'Amour, Ed Norholm. So I want to wrap it up for you. I do recommend you listening to the podcast. I'm going to put a link in the description of the video here so that you guys can hear from the horse's mouth. But some of you may not have the time for that. So I'm going to try to wrap up the main points here for you guys really, really quick. And um, hopefully I have no issues with this. Last time I did this, I wrapped up the Top is, Talk is Jericho interview. And Talk is Jericho filed a copyright strike on me. Um, four strikes and my channel's done. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I think it was uh, a misunderstanding because I think they thought I uploaded the podcast on my channel, which wasn't what I did at all. So I've been trying to resolve it with them, but they are not responding, of course, because I'm too little, too small time for them. So I'm going to be careful with this. And uh, <laughs> hopefully it's, um, you know, ho hopefully we have no major issues. So um, took some decent notes here. So let me jump right into it. They're in the UK right now. Um, why are they there? Well, they feel it's a strong market and that they got away from it the last couple of years. It's something that the wrestlers are like really excited to, you know, when it's time for the UK tour, something they're very excited to do, you know, and obviously in the last couple of years, they've kind of gone away from it. You know, we, there was no tour last year, uh, no tour this year. And I believe 2019 is the target date. Only know that because they said that previously. I think it might have been on the teleconference but I believe they said 2019. Um, so they're trying to re-engage themselves with the UK market and said that they're basically on a scouting mission. And that could mean looking at talent. It could mean, uh, you know, strengthening their relationship with Spike UK, amongst other things. But the, but the main focus there is to really, you know, get involved in that market again so they can start giving it some attention. Regarding Jeremy Borash, I reported this, I shouldn't say reported this, but I, um, I dropped this knowledge on another video where I said, even though they're kind of saying the right things, I've been told that they're actually very upset in the, in, in the manner that he left. And, it, you know, it was out of nowhere. There was a lot of roles that he was, you know, he was going to play a big role on Twitch and, you know, he just kind of up and left, which is just cr of all people pretty crazy. But they said regarding Jeremy Borash, uh, at first they joked around like, wait, he left the company like they were, you know, they made a joke out of it. But they said with change brings new opportunity and that they have a lot of other names behind the scenes that we don't know. You know, we, we hear the name Jeremy Borash. We all know who that is. But, you know, he lifts uh, Scott listed off a couple other individuals Hey, you don't you don't know these guys, but these are guys who are ready to step up. And it's not it's not bad to bring in change and get a fresh perspective. So. You know, they're looking for the next Jeremy Borash, basically, but they sound pretty confident that they've got some some hungry individuals ready to step into that role. And they could be better. You know, that's that just my, my take on it. They kind of have an 18 to 24 month plan. So, I, I you know, I know that they obviously have said they don't expect change to happen overnight, but they are, you know, they're looking. I mean, they've said before at the end of this year, they want to be in a better place than the beginning, but it looks like they're. They're looking about a month and a, I mean a month, a year and a half to two years out for for some real change as far as just the direction of the company. But you know it is going to be cons and growth, and they are sticking to the ideas that they had when they first got the job. They they were officially on the job January first, so they might have been you know shooting around some ideas or whatever. But they're staying pretty true to what they think they need to do. So when they had their first meeting with Ed and said, "This is what we want to do." They're sticking to that plan. They're both in agreement, for the most part, regarding all the changes. Excuse me, uh, the changes being made. They felt that the ring, the four-sided ring, you know, it was basically unanimous with the wrestlers, but they felt like the ring was easier to wrestle in. So basically, what uh, you know, the thinking behind that is that if the ring is easier to wrestle in, the matches will be better. The wrestlers can perform better if they're more comfortable in the ring. So that makes pretty good sense. And uh, Don Callis was saying, you know, obviously they're not going to pay attention to every single thing said on social media, but he did, he, he did joke that, you know, you get free advice on social media. They were very w aware that the majority of the people did not like the grand championship. 
Um, some people were, you know, complaining about the ring, even the fans. And there was a lot of complaining about the broadcast team. So that's why they're making the necessary changes. It doesn't mean that everything that is said they're going to do because we're we're not experts. And even me, when I try to preach, I've got a business mindset. I'm still not an expert at this. So we have to trust those who who, who really are um, when, they, when there's competent people in place just like them. They want to build a new roster to get people excited. So, you know, when guys like AC3 leave or whatever, what they were saying was people talk about who left all the time, but they don't talk about who we got in, who we got back. So, yes, EC3 left, but we got Brian Cage in return. Nobody's talking about that. No one's talking about Austin Aries and Sue Young and the other people they're, they're bringing in. There's too much focus on who is leaving, and they often forget who's replacing them. But they really do want to build a, a brand new exciting roster, and if it means certain people cycling out that's just the case because they said the business is circular and this is true wrestlers are going to cycle in and out of the company just like a sports franchise but they've always provided a platform for unknown wrestlers and they want to continue to provide that platform and some people are going to take the ball and run with it in impact wrestling and some are you know could take that ball and run with it elsewhere they're going to try some new things regarding spoilers you know obviously we all know when when uh, the title changed, you know, they, they put the spoiler out themselves and they're going to continue to, to to toy with that stuff. They may even go as far to on the website or, or Twitter, or whatever, put out a link and say, click here for spoilers. So they're, they're looking at actually being willing to give spoilers for those who want it, you know, because as, as we said before, it's almost like everyone breaks their news, but them. So at least they can put that that outlet there for the people who do want to know the spoilers. They were saying, you know, we don't like spoilers. If, I, if I'm watching a show on TV, I don't know. I don't want to know what's going on. And that's the really crazy thing with the wrestling world. I don't watch a whole crap load of TV. Um, admittingly, I love the bachelor and the bachelorette franchise. I joke about that all the time, but I really do like the show. Um, I don't want to know who wins in the end. So, and, and, and that's really like that with movies in general, TV shows in general, we seem to have respect for each other when it comes to reality, television, TV shows, uh, you know, episodic shows, uh, movies. We seem to have that respect for each other, but we don't in the wrestling world. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, four live events in March. Two are going to be in Canada and two are in California. So I, I think one is that um, it's been announced might have been big time wrestling or something along those lines. Uh, so two, two in Canada and two in California, um, and they'll be broadcasted on, on the Twitch app. I'll get to the Twitch here again in a second. I took some more, uh, some more notes later. Um, the Desi hit squad, you know, they were asked about that. And if you, if you don't know, that's the, you know, the Indian stable that Hakeem Zane is in and, uh, Tony cage was another recent sign and they've all, all got name changes and everything. And, you know, they, the stable wasn't to like necessarily appease the Indian audience, you know, like obviously the whole Jinder Mahal situation was like that was pretty much done as a blatant attempt to appease an audience and try to monetize it. Like that's not really what this is about. It's more of a global approach. So, yes, the digital numbers they have are great in India. So they want to they want that to reflect in their product. So the people, you know, the countries who are watching and are invested in the product, well, they want they want them to be represented on the show. So that's kind of why they put the hit, hit squad together to give Indian fans something to get excited about. They understand they need to do this with UK and UK talent. And obviously that is not a market right now that they're hitting. And which is crazy because at one point TNA was really big on the UK market. And I mean, even as even a, a couple of years ago, people were like, oh, they need to stop focusing on the UK and get some talent in the United States, you know? So it, it's it's just one of those things where we, let's attack Impact Wrestling for what they're doing, you, you know what I'm saying? And um, and now that other companies are messing with the UK and the UK is a hotbed, all of a sudden it's just like, well, so Impact isn't going to be a part of that? So they understand that they got to rebuild that partnership and um, that's going to be something they're going to really focus on because they want to, rep, uh, you know, um, represent the worldwide market who watches the show. So if you're watching it from another country, they want you to have someone that you can relate to. Uh, Don Catlis said something kind of interesting here, uh, and some people could take this, you know, a different way. They're looking at talent who doesn't care about, you know, doing the dives and the 450 splashes because 
he, he was saying that stuff isn't compelling anymore. You know, you watch a, a show, you watch an indie show and you just see that stuff like nonstop and it almost means nothing to this point. And he brought up old school wrestling said, when I came up in the industry, we wanted to look different. You know, they went to the gym, they grew out their hair and he's like, now we're in this era of let's look like the fans. The wrestlers aren't going to the gym. They're not working on their bodies. They want to build a partnership with the crowd and get the, this is awesome chance. And that's not what they want. Excuse me. I got a coffee. I've been holding this in. <coughs> Ooh, thanks guys. Um, they want to, you know, they want good guys and they want bad guys. They want good guys to rep, you know, generate good guy reactions, bad guys to generate bad guy reactions, but they, they don't want to get into that. And this is, you know, I, I guess NXT does this. This is what they call the vanilla midget thing and everything. You know, like it's like guys that just look like they have no character personality. They just look like they came from the crowd, you know? So that's something they really want to to get away with. So it sounds like creatively they still want to have characters and everything. And that's been a concern with th some people when they said, oh, they're going to work on the in-ring product where, you know, what's going to happen creatively. Like it looks like they want an overall good, um, you know, to attack it from all angles. Um, they also think that cutting a promo is a lost art. And it, this is something, man, like I'm telling you, someone said, uh, Colby Cooper, shout out to you. You said, you know, you really think someone listens to my channel sometimes because a lot, a lot of what I say seems to come to fruition. Um, and it's probably by chance. I'm not, uh, my ego is not that big, but one thing I have always said is that, you know, wrestlers will have a certain character. And then when the bell rings, that character has gone. You know, so what Don, Don Callis was saying, someone will cut this great heel promo or got, cr get great promo in general and character, and then they get in the ring and there's there's no character anymore. They're just a wrestler. And I've used Doink the Clown as an example. If you um if you remember the act the good Doink, not the you know when they re rebooted him as a comedy character, like the good Doink the Clown, where he was an evil clown, but he still did a lot of um really weird stuff but when the bell rang yes he was a serious competitor but it, but it was still true to the the clown character you guys see what i'm saying so i do understand where he's going with that you know the character has to carry over to the in-ring product as well can't just be a promo you cut and then you get in the ring and you're two normal people um they were they were, they were asked about jeff jarrett and they said a relationship didn't work as they had hoped but there was no business relationship between the two. So very brief, you know, they said, good guy, wish him the best, but they said it did not work out the way they wanted to. And, you know, once upon a time last year, Jeff Jarrett, you know, released that whole, their hemorrhaging, um, fun statement. And the way that I flipped it for the audience, when I was trying to explain Anthem has money, but they don't have money for Jeff Jarrett's bullshit. Like if you look at Slammiversary, like you could just see watching that show, like how much money they threw out the window, you know, like it was a great show, but there were so many bells and whistles to that thing that it's kind of like, okay, how much of this was actually necessary. And then by the time Black bound for glory rolled around, it was just like a regular ass wrestling show. So I think that Jeff Jarrett, um, really sold. And I was very high on Jeff at the, at the time, but I think he did kind of sell some snake oil and, and, you know, even with the live events and stuff, I think he, um, got Anthem to spend more money than they should have, um, in his smart, t short time with the company. Um, <laughs> this was kind of funny. He says, I'm watching Scott Moore says, I'm watching the Twitch app and I'm watching, uh, you know, the first ever knockouts gauntlet. He's like, and this was right around the time of the Royal Rumble. And he, and he said, you know, I, I think he said he watched the Rumble or he, you know, was paying attention. They said, and they said, oh, there's nothing ever been done like this before and this and this. And, and he said, oh, well, a decade ago, we did the first ever gaunt, women's gauntlet for the uh, first ever knockouts championship. And the gauntlet is basically the Royal Rumble. So thank you for 10 years later, almost catching up with us. <laughs> so almost like he threw a little bit of shade there, but you know, um, and regarding Twitch, they said they're really happy with Twitch that, you know, already in a couple of weeks, hundreds of thousands of views and, you know, streaming, streaming revenue, revenue is never going to be groundbreaking. And I don't think I actually, I'm, I have no idea, but I don't think the impact is going to do a, a, uh, through Twitch, a uh, membership program. 
I, I don't see the point of that. I don't think that's where they want fans to spend their money. But there is money in streaming audio, you know, uh, streaming video. I mean, it's it's usually a you know a penny per view, maybe sometimes even a little under a penny. But when you, every time you see that ad pop up, and that ad might be there for five or ten seconds, you may not even notice it. You know, that company is paying the uh, the platform, you know, a penny for that stream. So there is some money in it, but it's still money they weren't receiving before. So it's still a really good thing. But uh, with that being said, they're very happy. Hundreds of thousands of views in a couple of weeks. And at first, Scott was like, we have enough channels, you know, talking about Pluto and all that. Like, he was just like, how many more channels do we need? But now he's and he wasn't too familiar with Twitch, but now he's he's really marveling at it. And he really feels that they got to they want to provide um, the opportunity for, for fans to watch what they want, when they want and where they want. So it's good to have, you know. It's good to have a well a well balance, and the Twitch is cool sometimes. You, I just fire it up, and I'll see some random match, you know, and uh, really cool to watch. So that is it. Um, I've been talking here for over 16 minutes, but I mean, it was a uh, a lot to cover. And if you're still listening, appreciate it very much. I, I did my best to try to wrap it up as quick as possible. I am going to put the link in the description so that you guys can click and listen to the podcast directly. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Peace.